Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the first event for Hillary term. We hope that this finds you uh, well rested, uh, excited to be back wherever it is, whether it's school or just back at work, um, and excited to learn a little bit more about uh, climate change and sustainability. Uh, as always, my name is Andy, and I'm the events director of the Oxford Climate Society uh, and a current master's student at Oxford studying environmental change management. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, the Oxford Climate Society is a student society at Oxford, and we aim to develop the next generation of informed climate leaders through uh, weekly speaker events like the one we're hosting today, uh, but also through educational programs uh, such as our School of Climate Change, uh, which teaches over around 1,500 people from across the world, in addition to the uh, Anthroposphere, which is our student climate uh, journal. and more information about all that work and the events that we do can be found on our website. But uh, today's event centers on green architecture and we're really excited to be uh, welcoming Ken Yang, who's really a pioneer in this field to be uh, discussing this event uh, and to be answering all of our questions. So Ken Yang is both an architect and an ecologist uh, and he's known for his innovative ecology-based uh, eco-architecture and master plans that have a distinctive green aesthetic. He trained at the Architectural Association School, holds a doctorate from Cambridge University on ecological architecture and planning, uh, and has also authored over 12 books on green architecture. For this work, he's received uh, awards, including the Aga Khan Award, uh, the Malaysian Institute of Architects Gold Medal, uh, and the Malaysian Government's Merdeka Award. He holds a distinguished plim professorship at Illinois University, uh, and the Guardian newspaper names him as one of the 50 people who could save the planet. Uh, so we are very, very fortunate to have him here today. Uh, he's gonna start with a brief presentation. And with that, I'll just uh, pass it over to you, Ken. I can speak to all of you. Um, this is the work that I've been working for a, a few decades. And um, the title of my presentation is called, uh, is Designing for Resilient Planet. And um, I usually speak for about uh, 40 to 60 minutes. So today is a very short uh, lecture. And I just covered two topics and two sets of ideas on egocentricity, which is designing based on the science of ecology and eco-mimicry, which is remaking our built environment as human-made ecosystems. I'm going to discuss briefly what is my process because um, as an architect, we do research, design, and we build at the same time. So we define our objectives, we carry out research, uh, and then both in-house and with outside consultants, uh, we try and interpret our ideas in design, and then we test it in some of our built projects as prototypes, and then we evaluate and we produce books, and we go back to do more research again. So in a nutshell, this is what we do um, in the process of working at our office and um, at the same time, um, try to make some money, I suppose. And uh, if people ask me, what do I do? I said, I do four hours. First one is reading because I'm a compulsive reader. Second is that I write a lot of books because I like to put my thoughts into writing. Third hour is arithmetic. I try to make some money. And the fourth hour is of course, architecture. So the first subject topic I'm going to talk about is um, ecocentricity, which is designing based on the science of ecology. I wrote my doctorate at Cambridge University on ecological design planning, and part of the you know the process of working on this doctorate, I had to go to the um, study ecology at the Department of Environmental Biology. Now everything for me starts with nature because this is the baseline the original context in which everything that we as human beings do and, uh, and start with the planet, the planet's covered with this thin film called the biosphere where organisms live and exist. Now within this biosphere, there are units in nature which ecologists call ecosystems. And ecosystem consists of communities of plants and animals or biotic and abiotic constituents acting together to form a whole system. And so um, now within this, uh, complex as us as human beings. Now we are part of the biotic community, but we're different. 
with the most powerful of all the um, of the, the uh, biotic constituents, the form of species in nature. We're able to change landscapes, we change waterways, and now we have changed climates so to the extent that we're changing um, the landscape of the planet. And then the next thing is that we make things as human beings. We make more things than any other species in nature. We clutter the whole world with stuff. Now, there's things that we make. I use the word built environment. It's not just buildings, infrastructure, cars, toys, you know, uh, clothing, and including food. And so if you look at what we're making, we are simplifying the, the planet with artificial synthetic things. And that it occurred to me that everything that we make is physical, you know, except of course the few landscapes and, and the food that we make. And um, where is the body constituents? Not much of it because we are slowly clearing, devastating, removing forests and removing um, the natural environment. And so the idea that occurred to me was that what happens? What if we redesign our built environment and remake it as human made ecosystems? And so this was the proposition that I had, and this is what's driving the, what do we do in our office, and that everything we do, whether it's master plans, whether it's buildings, or whether it's devices and, 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 and built systems, uh, we try to make them into human made ecosystems. And so to make this work, we had to do research on what constitute an ecosystem attribute, which we need to emulate and replicate and, 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 um, and augment if we can. And so these are some of the ecosystem attributes that we try and uh, uh, emulate, emulate and mimic and, and replicate. It's not a comprehensive list, but it's, it's, it's still a list that I'm working on and that uh, we're trying to cover as much of this as possible um, in our work, in our business. Now you have to bear in mind that we, we are an architect, we're an architect company, and nobody pays for our research. So everything that we do um, you know, is funded internally, and that, that makes it twice as difficult to, to, um, to do what we do. So now let's start with the first uh, attribute I call the biological structure. So as you can see with this diagram, um, the constructed ecosystem, the ecosystem consists of biotic and abiotic con uh, you know, constituents. So how do we bring the biotic constituents into the built environment? So I started to diagram, this, uh, diagram it, and these are you know, some diagrams of different ways we could bring biotic constituents uh, as landscaping uh, into the built environment. You can put it all in one location, which I call centralized location, the first diagram. You can have a spotty dispersed relationship, as you can see in the second one. You can have a stepping stone relationship, as you see in the third one. The fourth is a tree where things are like a like a spine with with fingers sticking out, and then the fourth is um, I call it the uh, integrated um, integrated system in which everything's connected, and uh, and that um, now you can't just see the last uh, pattern as the preferred one because uh, um, the, the, uh, the vegetation connected, like we connected, it, it um, enhances greater interaction between the species and by being connected, enable a larger pool of natural resources to be shared among the species. And by having a larger pool of natural resources, it encourages um, a greater level of biodiversity and having a greater level of biodiversity, it is much more stable. In principle, that's what it is, but of course, you know, there would be variations to do that. So now, back in the what did we do? And if you go back to, um, so we started to put vegetation buildings, and this is a building that we did in 1985, where, you know, uh, we started to experiment with putting vegetation buildings, and, and the first building we did was had this spotty relationship. It's not desirable because you know this, uh, the vegetation is not connected, but um, it's it's you know we uh, it's the early uh, work and we put it in the in the in the in the balconies and the, um, sticking out from the, from the building, and um, you know it was it was it's a bit difficult trying to persuade the client to to have balconies, but the only way we could do it was to say that uh, the balconies outside the plot ratio. So to get an extra 2% over the plot ratio with the balconies. 
So we started at the same time to look at what does it mean to do the biochromatic or the passive mode low energy um, tall building. And we did studies on, on, on where to put the core of the position, where to put the core in position of the floor plate and how we could contribute to enhancing its uh, energy performance. And so as you can look at the set of diagrams on the left-hand side, you can either put it in the middle, you can, t you know, depending on orientation of the site in the building, um, you can put it, you know, and, and so these are different core positions which are in, indicated in yellow. Now, from the studies and calculations, um, the one with the core on the east side and the west side has the lowest energy consumption, because if you see that diagram on the right-hand side, which is the solar path for the tropics, and, and these were studies we did for the tropics, obviously, for, uh, for a temperate and cold climate, it would be a different position. And so um, so, with, so this building, the floor plate, as you can see on the right-hand side, you can see the cores on the, you know, on the left and the west, on, and on the east side and the west side. And then the north facade, I don't need to sun shade it because I don't get that much sun. And that the core and the lift lobbies are naturally ventilated or have the potential for naturally ventilated, so I don't have to, uh, um, have a uh, fire rated uh, and uh, I don't have to have um, a, you know, a, a, an exhaust duct you know, sucking there all the way up. So the second topic was, we moved on to, you know, obviously I have other examples, but, uh, but today, you know, I'm just going to show you one uh, of the bi biological structure. The next is biodiversity because, you know, nature is biodiverse, whereas <coughs> a human built environment is, is, is simplified. And so we started looking how we can enhance the biodiversity of, of locality. Now, um, this is a, a diagram which is, I found quite useful because it, it applies to, you know, quality of butterflies. Mm -hmm. But obviously the biodiversity increases as you head towards the, um, the equator. And so the project I'm gonna show next is at latitude 2.9 degrees. And so it is um, it's a very highly, it's a highly biodiverse locality. Now, in our design, uh, in our design work, the first thing we do is to look look at how we can cre uh, create habitats within the, uh, the the built system, within the building, around the building, and on the ground plane uh, and terraces you know, of the building. So we call these we make habitats uh, which are you know on the green roofs, vertical green with green walls, green sky courts, and so forth. And so this is one of the drivers of our design. When we start doing the the, um, when we start you know, drawing out the plan and the layout, we look at where we which where we can put the heavy thoughts. And as we started to develop our, our scheme, what we do now is if we create an ecological infrastructure going through the whole building, connected to the ground plane, which I'll show later on. This is a building that we completed about three years ago, and. Um, and uh, it's still being occupied and the habitats on the walls on, and on the sky courts and on the ground plane. And it, this building is in Putrajaya, which is the new capital city of Kuala of Malaysia. And um, it's, it's, it's a biggie, it's about 3 million square feet altogether. And, uh, and one, of the, one of the largest projects we did around that time. So what we do uh, when we just start designing is we create the habitats and we prepare what we call a biodiversity matrix. Now this biodiversity matrix starts with identifying, you know, what habitats we locate in the building. And so you can see in the diagram right inside the two buildings, the building is basically two chevron shaped towers of about 15 stories with a podium. And then in between is that's a green area. And I explain why we have the green area in between later on. And the habitats, as you can see, is in black and red in the upper diagram. So we, that's the first thing we do. We identify, we create habitats. The next is to try and look at what are the native fauna that we want to bring back to this locality because the land has been devastated. The rainforest has been cleared, was converted into an all time estate, and all time estate has been removed again. And it's just the red soil when we appointed you know, to, uh, to work on this project. So we started to, to, to look at, do research on the surrounding ecology of the context and what is the native fauna that we want to bring back non-invasive fauna, non-hazardous fauna we want to bring back into the site. Next is to look at what is the flora that will attract the fauna. And then once we got this in place, we look at the interaction with the habitats. And with that, they then give us clues on designing the uh, landscape conditions 
uh, for the whole project. So in this way, the whole building becomes a, 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 a series of habitats that almost like as a constructed ecosystem. Um, here's a location of the building. It's along the boulevard leading to the Prime Minister's office near the waterfront. And there are two axes, one in along the boulevard, the other axis is going to the Millennium Monument, which was also designed by us about, um, about eight years ago. And so here it is, that's the, 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 the square and access down to the waterfront, uh, which is the monument. And there's the monument. Um, and monument has a series of segments which records the, uh, the history of the country uh, since independence. And, uh, and opposite the, uh, the monument is the, uh, on, near opposite that building is the Ministry of Finance building. And this is the, the view of the Ministry of Finance building before our building was built. And you can see the monument on the right-hand side. National identity is particularly important in Malaysia. So we took the national flower, which is the hibiscus, and the monument uh, and its base is shaped like an uh, abstract version, abstract metaphor of the hibiscus flower. And these are the two buildings. They're chevron. They're almost symmetrical in shape. Um, they're, they're not exactly symmetrical because of the site configuration. And in between, this is promenade where people could sit and 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 and, uh, and 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 commune with each other and on off the sides of both sides of, of the buildings are, are eating uh, food and beverage outlets. Now we did want to have a flat shaped building, and although that the inside wall is a double skin building, and so we wanted to experiment with an alternative to the conventional horizontal louvers. So one of the ideas we had is, is that if we use glass, which are not butt jointed, they are spaced apart a little bit with using fritted, fritted pattern uh, of about 50% of the glass area um, to provide sun shading. So um, the first image shows the passageway between the inner plane and the inner skin, and outer skin, and that this is for servicing and, and, and as, a, as a sort of air barrier. Um, and then the second diagram shows the fritted pattern of the glass, which is they're, they're, they're not butt jointed, so they're, they're spaced about you know four inches apart. And that uh, you can then you can see the fritted pattern on it. It's about fifty percent with fritted glass. Uh, the third image is what it looks like from the inside, looking out. Um, you can see a bit of fritted pattern along glass, and you, and it, we this enables us to facet the shape of the building to make it almost like a jewel um, uh, in a locality. And then on the west side, we angled it because it's not exactly north-south. And so we angle it to, to protect from the Western sun. And so, <coughs> in, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in, <coughs> in effect, you could tell the orientation of the building, which is north and which is south, by just looking at the facade of the building. Now, these are some energy studies which were done uh, a normal office building in Malaysia uses 210.57 kilowatt hours per square meter per annum, whereas our building with the fritted glass uses 138, 138.18, which is about 70% less. And so in that sense, it is uh, by all means and purposes to demonstrate that as a working, as a sun shading and an energy saving device, it lowers energy consumption of the building. And this is part of our biochromatic design strategy. And so, you know, that's what we do, you know, to enhance the biodiversity of the building. And now one of the things we have in this project is what we call an eco cell. Um, this image on the top is the master plan we did for the competition for the um, Kowloon waterfront. We didn't win it. I think we, we got honorary mention or something, you know, which is you know, towards the bottom of the uh, packing order. Um, and, but in, we do, competitions as research projects and so for, for this project uh, we, we we developed the idea of what called eco cell which is voids that we that we cut from the podium going all the way down to the basement another idea we had this project so you can see like little fingers sticking out uh, what we call uh, peer towers you know towers which are peers that stick out into the waterfront and these are the eco cells the eco cell does a number of things it brings vertical integration of vegetation all the way from the roof down to the basement, to the deeper parts of the building. It provides opportunities for rainwater harvesting and collection. Uh, it provides the natural um, ventilation into the lower parts of the building and to the floors of the building. It provides, brings daylight 
and also at the bottom you could have an eco machine or a bioswale uh, <coughs> or rainwater collection tank. And then we brought the vegetation in this building from the third floor going all the way down to receive the ramps and going down to the basement. So this is what an eco cell looks like in the building, um, joining the building. It's an experiment, it's not 100% perfect. It's an idea that we had. And so now, then how do we apply this idea? How do we apply the biodiversity matrix idea to a high rise? And so the pattern we adopted in this project, which is, which is now under construction, which is the tree with fingers sticking out, and that we have a series of sky courts. You know, you can see the detailed sky courts on the right-hand side. And that we start by doing research on surrounding area, as, I, as is in the earlier project, on what are the native fauna, flora, that we want to bring back to enhance this very, very urban site. And so these are the habitats we want to create in the building. And one of the ideas we had was to have a tree, uh, a, a vertical green wall as a tree in the facade of the building. And here, what we did was for the lower parts of the floor, uh, we uh, this is what I call the dragonfly zone, the middle is the butterfly zone, and then the songbird zone and the other parts, there's the migratory bird zone. And, um, and this is the biodiversity matrix we did for this project. And this is the other parts of the building and where the, where the swimming pool and the, and the community facilities are located. And so this is an example of how we had applied the biodiversity matrix to a low rise and medium rise building. And then vertically, you know, uh, this is how we, had, uh, uh, we uh, this was the idea that we had, the type of fauna that we want to bring back into the high rise. And so um, the other idea is connectivity because in nature, everything's connected. So as you know, you know, if you've gone through the, as having gone through the COVID um, experience, um, we never realized that you know, we cannot, it's almost impossible in nature to isolate ourselves, you know, uh, uh, um, totally from, from uh, for other human beings or nature. And so nature's connected. But what we human beings do is we fragment the land. We separate the ecosystem with, with, uh, with habitats, with drains, with roads, with fences, with built up areas. And so one of the things we need to do is to reconnect nature. I call this the making nature whole. And so people ask me, what do we do? How do we make the city green? What's the first thing we do? I said, yes, before you start to look at the, you know, the buildings, before you need to look at the infrastructure, before you need to look at infrastructure, you need to look into how we can reconnect the, the, the city and make it you know, as connected as possible um, uh, as it was you know, before we chop up the, 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 the locality. And so we should try to connect it at the ground plane as much as we can and bring it up the building, bring it up you know, so that the whole city then becomes in you know, a vertical uh, forest. Now, this is a competition scheme that we did in Singapore. We didn't get, you know, we didn't get first prize, we got second. Um, and that, uh, strangely enough, you know, the, the person who got the first prize, you know, asked me whether he could work for us afterwards. So I said, oh, well, certainly. Um, and with this project, we started to develop the idea of a continuous ramp that goes all the way up to the top of the building from the ground plane that works its way up. And so the plan is also on the right hand side is a series of ramps that, that wraps us around the building, which is a cultural building. It has museums, has art galleries has studio working offices and have food and beverage outlets, fancy restaurants and so forth. And the idea was that whenever the, the, the vegetation reaches the same level of the adjoining buildings, we bridge across the adjoining buildings and then we, we bring the vegetation across. So in this way, it becomes the catalyst for greening the city. It was just an idea, you know, nobody's not adopted it yet, but it's an idea. And so there was this, we did that competition design, I think, in 2001 or 2002, and then we fast forward, you know, eight years, 2010, um, that's we started, you know, finally able to apply in, in reality in a built project. This is the, this was the, um, this is the, the conceptual drawing that we did. So this time we put a ramp right next to the vegetation so you can service the vegetation on the outside without having to going through the, uh, the office floors. And here it is, it's built, it was built in 2009, 2010. There's the Solaris building in Singapore. You can see the walkway, you can see the vegetation, you can see the curtain wall, you can see the vegetation on the, on the, the sun chaining on top of the building. And with this building, we're able to we design it to climb a floor with every facade. And so in this way, we brought the vegetation from the ground 
in the eco cell going all the way up to the top of the building. And then um, these are, this is some of the pathways, you know, the upper floors of the building. Uh, this is the ramp in the climbing up the facade. And this is the view of the building out right on from a distance in the uh, Novena district in Singapore. The tall building on the left hand side is by the famous uh, uh, Japanese architect Kisho Kurokawa. And the whole master plan of the site was done by Zaha Hadid. And so uh, we call this the linear park. You know, we create the, but to punctuate the, the, uh, the, the, the ramp, we had sky courts at the corners. And so these are where the sky courts are. And so that then people can actually from outside, inside can go to the sky court and they can have a drag or have a cigarette and, and have breakfast or have a meal and a cup of coffee. But they can have conversations outside the office at these sky courts. And so you can see the sky courts at the corners. And the right hand side is the tower we're working on in London with the social sky courts going up to the top of the building. And then this is the green park at, at the uh, at the ground floor. I should have connected um, the vegetation in the green park, but at that time we uh, we we did not think of it. But there's something we should have done. It. But you can see the mid-level gardens going all the way up to the top of the building. And here is this the view from the top of the building. You can see the gardens at the top. This is the mid-level park, and then this is the path at the top of the tower. So it is it's a pleasurable space to be in. You know that, and we think. A lot of architecture is not just making green, making it meeting criteria um, and making it iconic, aesthetically fulfilling. It's to make people happy. And that to me is the prime objective of architecture. And if we're able to achieve this in what we design, then our, our whole purpose is much fulfilled. And so the green index in Singapore, to get the green mark platinum, you have to meet the index of six, which is the ratio of the vegetation of buildings in the building to the, to the vegetation on the ground. Here we reached a, a green ratio of 12.2. And so the, the, well, I show this diagram, uh, uh, this matrix, because um, the, uh, the performance requirements of any rating system, whether it is Green Building Index, whether it's LEED, whether it's CASB in China, um, it's, just, it's just a series of figures. We should try and exceed it as much as we can. Rather than than you know use to say oh we fulfilled it and that's it we we um, <clears throat> we make the building green. <clears throat> the shape of the site was <clears throat> was given by Zaha, <clears throat> and in fact the designs two blocks A and B with an H in between, and then it's, it is you know it's made is unified um, by the facade which goes all the way around the facade of the building. But, the, but in the middle of the atrium goes all the way up and above the atrium, we have a glass operable roof, which is automated. And so that on the most days, this atrium is not air conditioned. We just have cold air blown into it. So, so this en enhances the energy performance of this building and that, you know, um, and hot air can go out. And that on a, this is how it looks like, you know, with, a, with the glass roof open and hot air can go out. But in inclement weather, if it rains, it automatically shuts. And so in, in fact, the building is almost like a, it's like a robotic building. And then the two blocks are linked by bridges and there's the bridge linking the two blocks and that um, there's the bridge. And then, you know, with every project, we try and innovate, try and experiment. And with this project, we, we had what we call a diagonal light shaft, the light shaft that cuts diagonally across from the top of the building uh, from here with the you know, top light shaft faces the atrium. And this is looking down the street. So on the street, they actually look up, they can see the building. And so it's not, it's not, you don't, you don't have a at your face glass wall at the ground plane, but you can actually see up and see what happens to the top of the building. And that little white square shows um, shows the uh, the light shaft. So the light shaft actually cuts in the middle of the floor, brings daylight to the middle part of the building, all to be down to the ground plane. Uh, on the right hand side, in the right diagram, it's a daylight simulation. And obviously it is not uh, an ideal floor plate, you know, that's like in Germany, no, no desk should be more than seven meters uh, for, from the extended wall. And here we, we, we are by far more than seven meters, but I had to meet, you know, it's the, um, uh, the plot ratio requirements for the client and height restrictions. So, um, and so it's a compromise. Um, this is looking up the light shaft. You can see, you know, the floors above and the top of the atrium. Now the eco cell idea that I showed in the other project is located at this corner, 
And here is much more compact, it's brought all the way down, vegetation from the uh, top of the building flows all the way down the ground and all the way down into, into the basement. And so um, next is the, um, one of the attributes that we should, most important attribute that we try and emulate and replicate is the provision of ecosystem services. Now, ecosystem services are, are things that nature does for us without human intervention. And so a whole list of them, it produces oxygen, it sequesters uh, pollution, uh, it, it, it purifies water, and the ecosystem generates, you know, recycles material and so forth. So it occurred to me, my goodness, it's totally impossible for us to replicate this, extremely difficult technologically. So what do we do? Do we give up and say, okay, it's a, you know, you know, it's a nice idea and, you know. So we thought, well, the way to do it is to augment the built environment, use nature to, to bring ecosystem services into the built environment. So the idea was to then to weave nature into the built environment. And so this is a scheme that we did for um, uh, the island of La Reunion, uh, which is uh, east of Madagascar. And here you can see the, the, um, the, the urban fingers uh, going from the urban areas and the roads going down to the waterfront. And then from the waterfront, there is a spine that collects all the vegetation. And then the two are woven together into, into a compact diagram. And so in a nutshell, this is, it, this is what we try to do. So we call this augmenting uh, the built environment with nature. So the nature is in the close proximity of the built areas. And so in this way, uh, it provides, you know, um, it provides uh, ecosystem service as close to the building as possible. But if you look at the city that you were in, it's London, you know, Hyde Park is, you know, is miles away from, uh, from, uh, from the city of London, and, you, you know, even you know, with, uh, with Regent's Park. So, you know, park is not sufficient. But even in Georgia and London with all those squares, you know, it is not sufficient. So you need to weave those fingers into, into the, um, into the into the into the urban areas, and at the edges of these fingers must should not be pristine because they need to be irregular, um, and so that you know the species can find places to hide, find places to breed, and, and so forth. And so this is the scheme, and that but obviously we have roads going through, you know, the north south of the site, and so we create what we call ecological undercroft, where you know the roads you know um, go, go uh, either go below the, the you know. We have we bridge across, but which are, which are called eco bridge, or we eat undercroft where the, the vegetation go underneath across the uh, the area, and we work out that vegetation should be about you know about twenty meters wide, and the urban areas should be about uh, thirty meters. So this, if you like, is the guide. But obviously, this is a step in the dark, and we need to verify this. And in in any case, uh, in any event, um, you know, these sort of measures have to be done on a site by site site-by-site -site basis. And so these are the items that we just discussed today. I have about 20 minutes to say all that I wanted to say, ecocentricity and ecomimicry, um, and the idea of the ecosystem uh, attributes that we need to emulate. And in the box we see at the left-hand side, are, you know, the, the, those aspects of the uh, ecosystem attributes that uh, I, I presented today. And the rest of these are aspects which I don't have time to talk about because we have limited time. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ken, for, for delivering all that really great information. Uh, you know, it sounds like between biocells and biological structure uh, and enhancing biodiversity that there's a lot of really positive stuff going on in the space. Um, I just want to ask, a little bit about some of the tensions uh, that might also be surrounding green architecture, in particular, uh, you know, whether there is a relationship between greening the built environment and also uh, increasing the cost of living within a community. And if there does exist that relationship, how, uh, you know, you as an architect might go about navigating those uh, fine lines that you kind of avoid exacerbating existing environmental injustices uh, in the pursuit of designing green buildings. Well, um, designing green buildings is extremely difficult to justify commercially. And so doing green buildings than anything that we do is an ethical uh, endeavor. And so, you know, we try and persuade our owners that it is your responsibility 
um, to do green buildings and to do green development. But 10, 20 years ago, when we started to do green buildings, um, the objective was to mitigate the impact, negative impact on the natural environment. But now so much damage has been done that is no longer mitigation, it's a rescued and, and, uh, and regenerate and a repair mission. And so um, designing green buildings and, and making our, our human society, our social systems, economic systems, our political systems, our institutional systems, making them green um, is, is something that we must do. It's no longer a, a, you know, a con, you know, corporate social responsibility. It is an ethical, something we have to do as human beings. It is inevitable. And so our greatest problem is trying to persuade clients to let us do this. And so we, you know, we started doing, you know, we started practice back about back in 1976. For 20, 30 years, it was extremely difficult. And so what we did, you know, in those years was to do what we call passive mode, low energy building or biochromatic building. So we shaped the buildings to be naturally uh, a, a low energy before we put in the system, mechanical electrical systems. And it wasn't until the, the late 90s that we got, you know, then, you know, as, as Norman Foster said, you know, all of a sudden, a large group of people just jump up and says, and said, we have to do something about the environment. We have to do this. And in fact, the British Parliament now, you know, uh, enacted something that, that, that encourages people to do that. And then that's when the late 90s, that we got better engineering support. The better engineering support that support them were able to, you know, more greener buildings. And from the year 2001 onwards, you know, we have clients who actually come to us and say, you know, we want to have a green building. Could you, you know, give us something high, not just green, because, you know, if you go down the road, every architect today says to do green buildings, but we say we do ecological, authentic green buildings, which contributes, you know, towards um, saving the planet. And so, um, so, you know, in others, we had 30 difficult years of trying to do green buildings. And from 2001 and two onwards until today, we had 20 years of um, enjoying, you know, uh, working with clients, uh, asking us to do buildings. So that's the first thing that we had to do, um, to, you know, that their neighbors do buildings. And now with people use the buildings, two things, three couple of things. First of all, by having a green building, um, they feel ethically correct, they feel right. And then secondly, it creates a healthier environment. You get greater fresh air, great natural, more natural ventilation, you get greater sunlight coming to the building. And so it creates a healthier building. And by having a healthier building, it encourages the productivity of the people within the building. And in doing so, you know, owners are much more uh, uh, amenable to having uh, in the green buildings. And that's some of the issues we, we uh, um, we uh, encounter. The third issue is price. He will say to me, does a green building cost more? The Solaris, bu Solaris building in, in Singapore, um, that's the one with the uh, spiraling ramp going all the way out the top. Um, the, the cost of, uh, of greening it, of those green features, is 16% 16, 16 over the industry standard for that building type. But we calculated that with the energy and water savings in that building, um, it's about 70 cents per square foot, something around that figure. Um, it amortizes the cost of the, the, you know, the additional construction cost over a period of five to eight years. And so after the period of amortization, you continue to get the savings. And so, you know, of course, energy savings. So in this way, it is to a client's benefit that if you want to build a building that you want to keep as an investment, then this is something that would be beneficial to you. So these are things we have to do uh, to try and... Um, and explain it to to, um, to the people who use the building and the people who invest and the people who want to develop the building. And uh, so have you found that uh, when you explain that kind of cost benefit analysis to the clients that they are typically receptive to that information or uh, have you found that there, there exists this perception that green architecture is going to cost them more uh, and so you find a little bit more of that persisting resistance. Uh, and, you know, can you speak to anything about those dynamics? Well, like everything else, you know, about a third, you know, would reject what we do and the third, you know, uh, third, uh, you know, are very pro what we do and, and about, you know, the, the third uh, are somewhere in the middle. And so, um, 
it's as part of your uh, the marketing endeavor, I think, how, how to persuade people to do it. Um, and people like do things for you if, if, it, if there are features that they like, if there are um, benefits to why, why they, they should spend the money. And third, if it enhances the value of how they feel about themselves and about the project. <coughs> and so um, it's a constant battle trying to um, persuade people and, and um, you win some, you lose some. Mm -hmm. And and why do you think that they're you know of those third that are still kind of resisting? What do you think are those reasons for it, if not for the cost? Well, you can't you can't you know you can't please everybody, and so um, and we're just extremely busy. So you know if we want to, we just don't want to go out and force ourselves down other people's throats. If we tell them. This is a good for environment. You get a healthier building, you get natural ventilation, you get you know, more fresh air, and you save money at the same time. And you get this advertised for a period of time. <coughs> it enhances the um, the value of your building and then it, it enables it to um, to, to uh, you know the, the valuation of the building increases as it uh, over time. And so um, that's the best we can do, uh, Andy. Um, it's uh you know being an architect is it's not been easy and it's been a real you know rite of passage for me yeah sorry oh i think my internet's a little unstable there um but sorry. yeah just to, to move on a little bit to the uh the issue of scale uh you know green design obviously can be undertaken all the way from you know individual households to mid-level uh, buildings all the way to skyscrapers skyscrapers and so i'm wondering you know what kind of considerations uh would change at you know each of these scales and uh, what are some of the principles that you would say are constant and unchanging across all of those different scales of design well it, it all starts with money how much you set aside for the project and what i found is that the, the more the higher the budget that you have Obviously, you have, you know, instead of spending them on fancy fixtures and, you know, gold plated, you know, you know doorknobs and, and marble all over the place um, and fancy electrical fitments, um, you can you should allocate that to the green features. And so managing the cost uh, is something that we, you know, is a skill that we have to develop. And, um, and that is that is the challenge of doing a green, doing a green building, and where to allocate the money, where to spend the money, and is the uh, is the device, the system we are introducing, um, financially justifiable? Um, so, um, and and the other thing is that is, it's um, it's a strategy of how you how you do your business. So, for instance. Um, all my people do the financial analysis of a building. So before we even get appointed, we do the you know the financial viability you know study for the client. Most clients would have their own, but we do it to show them that if you spend so much on the building, you still make the profit that you want um, and based on the sales price and rental income, and and that. And so this, so we we use that as a basis for negotiating the budget for the building. Once we have the budget, then we design the costs rather than costs are designed afterwards. And so, you know, there are many aspects of architecture that that, um, uh, that we learn over time that, that help us um, do better work and, and, and make clients happy with us. Of course, there are some people, you, you, it's totally impossible to, you know, to make them happy if, they, if they're pissed off with you, they'll be pissed off with you, but you know, Obviously, it takes if people are pissed off. It takes enormous amount of energy to, to, to you know, to convert them. But um, you know, we have, like everything else, you have to take the rough with the smooth. And are there uh, you know individual design elements that are made possible through uh, you know the extra space of a size of a skyscraper that isn't possible in a smaller building? And also, uh, you know, are there specific elements that can only be done? Uh, in a smaller space? 
Well, the skyscraper is it's very difficult to 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 make a skyscraper in a sustainable building because it uses at least a third more energy materials um, than a conventional medium rise and low rise building because you have issues of structure, you have issues of sway, uh, you have issues of getting these services and energy to adopt the building. Um, like water supply, you could have a mid-level transfer tank every, you know, for the pumps that you have generally up 100, 120 feet. And so depending on the height of the building, you know, every 10 stories, you've got to have a mid-level transfer tank. And so, and so, you know, you, you get less of that sort of problem with the low rise and medium rise building. And so um, a skyscraper is justifiable if it is on a transport orientated development where people get to the city, get to the locality, and then it discourages them from using the cars to, um, to other buildings because the amount of energy is required to transport people within a high rise is only through the elevators, which is minimal, obviously small compared to using a, 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 you know, a, a gasoline vehicle. And so, um, but to put high rise buildings all over the city, um, it, it, is, it, it, it can make the city unsustainable. And for me, um, I, you know, one of the things we're working on now is that, um, Designing a green city starts with the infrastructure. It's not with the building. You know, you know, obviously a lot of people can do green buildings and do super green buildings and amazingly passive house um, buildings. But if the infrastructure that is connected to the building, an infrastructure, you know, of you know, whether it's roads, sewage, water supply, electricity, uh, and so forth, and IT systems are not green, then it, the city will never become green. And so we have to focus the infrastructure. We make the infrastructure first, then the builds become secondary. But you have to bear we have to bear in mind that infrastructure is both external external infrastructure, which is in the public realm, and there's the infrastructure which is inside the building, which is hidden within the structure and and the fabric. And so you know everything starts with the infrastructure. If the infrastructure is green then it's much easier to make everything else green, the building green, the city green, the district green, and, and, the, and community green. But the other thing I, I, is important is that green design is not just design, not design of buildings. It's the people who use it. Now, if we give you the greenest building in the world and you misbehave and you, and you, and you waste material, you waste energy, then what's the point of having a green building? And so a green building it starts with people. They have to want to be green, they have to live green, they have to operate the building in a green way and that everything starts, you know, everything stops with them because if they don't want to become green and they don't want to behave themselves appropriately, then the city and the community and the, um, and the urban environment will never become green. Yeah, the, the point of involving people in uh, some of these principles is, I think, really interesting. And it just raises a question of, uh, you know, whether uh, those people that are going to be living in these buildings and uh, using these green spaces are uh, involved at all in the design process of the building. Um, or, you know, can you speak to some of those stakeholders that might be involved throughout the process if it actually does uh, encompass some of the, the very people whose minds that uh, do need to be changed in that uh, who are actually going to be using that building? Well, we, I don't know. Um, when you involve too many people, it makes decision making, it slows down the whole decision making process. Yeah. And so, um, and persuading people, making people behave and, and live in a green way. Um, and it's very much like, like bringing up children. There are two ways, three ways to do it. The first way to get children to do what you want is through uh, persuasion and education. Uh, persuasion says, if you do this, uh, mommy and daddy loves you. So you do it because we love you and whatever. So the first way to get people to do things, which is the best way to people get people to do things is through persuasion. The second way to do it is through incentive. You know, if you, if you do this for mommy and daddy, you get, ice cream or you get to use the car over the weekend or you get whatever, you know, you can go up with your mates um, 
you know, uh, on Friday night or, or else. And then the third way, so persuasion, incentive, and the third is through a penalty. You know, if you don't behave, or you, do, you know, you get penalized, you get punished. In the same way, it applies to the to, to community. You tell people that if you recycle your, 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 your waste, um, uh, um, you get, you know, your, 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 the rates for your property goes down. If, you know, if you do such, such a thing, then you get incentives, you get tax breaks. But if you don't do it, then you get, you know, if it really contaminates the environment, you can put in jail or you can get, um, you can get, uh, you get fined. And so persuasion and education, incentives and uh, motivation, and the third is, uh, is penalty. Uh, the three ways to get people to do things. So you have to, depends on who's owning the building, who's running the building. It could be part of your tenancy agreement that you can't do this, this, and this, and this. And, and that, you know, if you want to use the, you know, the, the amazing communal facilities that we have now building, you know, the common areas, <clears throat> then these are some of the things you have to comply with. <coughs> Excuse me. That's good. Yeah, uh, and just, you know, I want to be conscious of time. So um, I'll ask one more question before we move to a few audience questions. Uh, but so I was wondering, you know, in addition to the principles of uh, biophilic design and biomimicry, uh, you know, does green design also factor in considerations of resilience or even adaptation to, to future climate hazards? And if so, how, uh, how you go about thinking about that? So I think you're the last, um, last, last sentence. Yeah, just wondering how, uh, you know, the, the green design that you uh, might do factors in resilience or adaptation to future climate hazards, uh, in addition to creating these, these biodiversity landscapes. Um, well, I'm not sure how to answer your question, but let me just go back a few steps. Um, what we're trying to do now is to develop our own rating system. What constitutes a sustainability, a sustainability uh, evaluation of our projects? How does it improve the biodiversity? How it improves the uh, um, phytomediation and how the vegetation um, absorbs contaminants and, and pollutants in the air? How does it, you know, it, it's a series of criteria and, and we're trying to make it quantifiable as well so that we can then compare one building with another building. That's one of the things that we're doing. But the other thing is that to look at architecture, not just in making it green, to me, an architecture, um, a work of architecture, um, have to do uh, a number of things. First of all, it must function, it must work. If it doesn't work, you know, circulation is awful or, or, or the systems don't work, then it's a useful chunk of hardware. And so a good architecture must function. And secondly, a good work of architecture must meet criteria, must be delivered on cost within time with a high standard. Of, 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 of construction and meet the, the, the requirements of the planning and building authorities and the fire authorities. And so must meet criteria as a second um, uh, aspect. The third is, um, is, is uh, it must be beautiful. Um, that's why we were architects, so we were art artists. You know, I was in New York the other day in a, in a whole series of buildings done by a very famous architect. And, you know, my friend who showed me that building said, um, well, these are, you know, you know, green buildings, they are lead platinum. And I said, they look beautiful, they are so ugly, I cannot believe it, you know, so a green building doesn't mean it is beautiful. And so the third criteria is that we must make our buildings as beautiful as possible. Of course, of course that's subjective, but that's, we are artists, you know, you can't make everybody happy, but you must sincerely want to make the building as beautiful as possible. But the fourth criteria that we, that we must fulfill, which is the most important one, is it must make people happy, it must give pleasure to their lives, it must enhance their well being. And can you imagine if you're an architect or an engineer and if you do a, a building, whether it's a master plan or where it's a serious building, and if it makes people happy, your whole purpose of life in life as an architect, as an engineer, is fulfilled because you have made not just your better the environment by making it green. Uh, we have also you know, improved the lives of the people who use it. And it doesn't, it doesn't um, require an awful lot of money to make people happy. The other day I was in uh, Bordeaux in, in the south of in the France, 
and between the the uh, the the, the, uh, the city council building, the road and the waterfront, there's a strip of green, and and the architect or the planner created a square in that area of about 100 meters to 100 meters, and it's lowered about four inches below the uh, level of the ground. But within the square, they have these jets at, at two meter intervals. And every 10 minutes, the jet you know, blows up a whole mist of, 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 of air and water. And then in, in very quickly, within 10 minutes, the whole square becomes misty and frothy. And I was there, at, you know, uh, on an afternoon, and there were uh, over a hundred people, you know, hundred two hundred people, having that time of their lives. It doesn't cost money to do this, you know. It's just you know, a bit of you know, granite and on the ground with with the jet and 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 that. And then after 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 about you know five ten minutes, you know, the the jet uh, recedes, the water is drained away, and then uh, the whole place is still again. And then after you know after a few minutes it goes up again you know it, it's uh, what a wonderful way to to make people happy it doesn't cost an awful lot of money it doesn't uh, takes a lot of effort but it does make people happy and i said that's the something we have to do in our work in our, in, in our architecture we just finished a, for example we just finished a project in um you know in johor and and you know for an australian uh, client and the critic went, wanted to publish the project and asked them, well, what do you think of this project? And they told this critic, we are living in paradise. And that really so made my day, you know, made my week or whatever, because that is the purpose of why we're architects. You know, designing green and designing low energy buildings, net zero energy, net zero water, net ecological impact, we now do it as our second nature, like part of the fun, um, you know, of, of what we do as an architect. But the real challenge is the how to bring joy, happiness, and uh, and pleasure to the people. Uh, that is to me the real purpose of architecture, and that's and that's what we should be doing. Yeah, yeah. The, the marriage between you know happiness and also sustainability, I think, is a really important positive factor for for getting everyone involved. Uh, but yeah, would you be able to take just one question? I know we're uh, we're pushing past time. It's just one audience question. Well, that's okay. I, I'm, I, I'm not going anywhere. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we have someone who wants to know, uh, in 10 to 15 years, what sustainable architecture features of buildings will have become commonplace, uh, and in the case of expensive technologies, more universally affordable? Well, uh, as I said, you know, it, it doesn't cost very much to make people happy. It doesn't cost very much to, to you know, cost a little bit more to make uh, uh, architecture and, and, uh, and a development green and as can be amortized over a period of time with energy and water savings. And so what happens in 10, 15 years time? I think what we need to move towards is what I call smart systems, smart city, automation and how technology can make, uh, improves the quality of our lives. And so that to me is, and, and smart technology can also contribute towards a sustainable future because it, it monitors and it assesses the um, humidity, temperature, the air quality and so forth. And so the next generation in the future would be the integration of smart systems with, uh, eco, you know, with uh, sustainable design. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, again for this really uh, informative and rich discussion. I know I learned a ton and I really hope that everyone watching today was also able to take uh, a little something away with them as well. So keep an eye out for uh, the rest of our term schedule. We should have a weekly events going on. Uh, and with that, I'll just bring this event to a close. Thank you again, Ken, for joining us today and for sharing your insights. Thank you. Thank you.